next speaker is uh, Bob Hanson, Iowa State University. Bob won the Kendall Award in 1966. And again, the person who organized the symposium in honor of Bob at that time is here, Jay Mann in the back of the room. And Jay, I recall how you introduced Bob. At that time, Jay was teaching at the University of Hawaii. And, uh, and he introduced his mentor with the word aloha. And he said, do you know what aloha means? And I don't think very many people did. I know I didn't. But he said it means love. And he said, really, that's part of what this symposium is about. Jay, I can tell you another story about something Bob told me about you before that time, but I, maybe I won't. Um, back then in 1966, uh, Bob Hansen's talk was titled Surface Films and the Propagation of Capillary Ripples. And today, uh, his title is On the Stability of Interconnected Bubble Networks. Bob Hansen, Iowa State University. What I'm going to talk about today is um, actually related to uh, the material that I talked about uh, those many years ago. And as a matter of fact, uh, uh, Jay Mann, whose thesis uh, concerned the subject of capillary wave, was much involved in my getting started on, on this game, as was Jacques Lucasen, who subsequently worked with me in this area. Uh, the um, particular thing that I want to talk about, and this has to do a little bit with what George was talking about, and just to show that this didn't start with my PhD dissertation, this uh, uh, first slide, do I control what it's here? is uh, stolen out of a book called by C.B. Boys called Soap Bubbles. And it's a little conceptual experiment in which you imagine that you uh, have bubbles here, here, and you can, by suitably adjusting these stop cocks, either blow up this bubble, blow up this bubble, blow up both bubbles, and uh, shut off this and connect the two, and so on. And you can do all kinds of experiments with that little T-joint, and this is old, over 100 years old. Now, the part that I want to talk about uh, particularly is illustrated by this slide here, in which you imagine that you had that previous slide, and you blew up two bubbles, uh, and then you connected them by a tube. And you ask whether those bubbles would uh, coexist, and if so, under what circumstances. Well, one knows from uh, <clears throat> either ancient times or from reading out Ed Adamson's book that uh, if you have a uh, uh, spherical bubble, <coughs> the pressure inside will be greater than the pressure outside. And assuming that you have two surfaces, one <coughs> on the inside of the bubble, one on the outside of the bubble, the difference in pressure between the inside and the outside will be 4 times the surface tension divide, divided by the radius of the uh, bubble. Now, if that being so, if the tensions are equal and the outside uh, pressure, P0, is the same for everything, plainly you can only have those two bubbles coexisting if there's a connection between them, if the pressures are equal inside, and therefore if the radii are the same. But if you look at that for just a minute, you'll recognize that equilibrium cannot be stable. <coughs> because if you transfer an infinitesimal amount of uh, gas from this bubble to this bubble, this one will get a little bigger. Therefore, its radius will get a little uh, bigger. Therefore, its pressure will get a little less. And therefore, that bubble will grow. This bubble will disappear. Its pressure will continually increase until it gets down to the point where its radius of curvature is that of the two. And it'll keep on shrinking until its radius, I can't, I, it's a little bit hard to see, but that part there is curved to have the same curvature as you have outside here. And at that point, the process will stop, and you'll only have one bubble left. Now, the thing that, uh, when I talked about the stability of an interconnected set of uh, bubbles, you might say, well, this is cheating. You're only showing two. 
But nonetheless, that contains the whole uh, germ of the uh, problem. And that problem is one of some generality, and in fact, uh, uh, perhaps many would not realize this, Perhaps many people think when you take a deep breath, your lung blows up like the inside of a football. But if you are a physical chemist, you recognize that process has got to transfer one heck of a lot of oxygen into your blood and a lot of carbon dioxide from your blood and out of, uh, into your uh, uh, airspace in, in a few seconds. And uh, therefore, it shouldn't be surprising to you that in fact, there's a very large surface area involved in the interior of your lungs in the form of, believe it or not, functionally interconnected bubbles called alveoli. And these little bubbles are the order of 100 microns in, in uh, diameter, and you have about 300 million of them in your lungs. But nonetheless, the, and, and furthermore, the problems of their stability are closely related to this, although they are more complicated than the soap bubbles that we'll talk about in a little bit. Now, if, if we go on then, uh, to consider what would happen if we uh, 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 had such uh, two bubbles interconnected. Let me back up just for a second. Let me quickly point out that in this particular case, and in a boy's case, I have a tube connecting these two bubbles. But the argument, for the argument, it's immaterial what the character of the connection is any connection serves the same purpose. It would only affect the rate at which the process develops. But in particular, if your gas has any solubility in the liquid, then the diffusion process serves the same purpose as the tube with just a different rate constant. And you can quickly conclude from just this statement that I've written up here that a pure liquid cannot foam. There is no way a pure liquid can foam because it will have a, a steady surface tension. And therefore, this problem of the um, um, inherent instability, uh, it cannot solve. More generally, you can see that uh, if we consider the flow between those two gases, if we actually have tubes connecting them, then we can quickly figure out just how fast the flow will go the law for the transfer, in, in the case of a gaseous material, instead of having a conservation of volume, you have a conservation of mole flow rate. And so uh, at constant temperature, that corresponds to a uh, 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 the rate of diminution of PV for the two bubbles. It's got to be equal and opposite in the sign. <coughs> and it turns out that the, um, the rate law goes like the difference in the squares of the pressures instead of the difference in the pressures. But the minute you look at that a little more, you realize that this can be factored into a, a sum and a difference. And then if you just run through that quickly, lo and behold, for the case where the pressures are principally P0, you boil down to the same law that you have when you deal with uh, the flow in a capillary viscous Now, uh, go on a step further. Uh, one can then ex uh, develop an expansion of this. <coughs> <coughs> Somehow or other, I seem to have jumped to it. There was an equation at the bottom of the previous Yeah, slide. let me get, get that back there. Yeah. Now, that's not <coughs> critical. No. All right, but, but is off the top. Yeah. Oh, there we are. Nothing you can do. All right. I, I, oh, no, that's just the title of it. That's just the title of it. That's immaterial. The important thing that I want to point out here is this little equation right here, in which you see at the end that what becomes critical is the rate of change with the radius of the ratio sigma over r. Now, if sigma is independent of r, then as r increases, the, the derivative d by di sigma over i will surely be a negative number, right? It'll be sigma over minus sigma over i squared. And that is exactly what will lead to your instability. But if sigma can change as r changes, then it is possible <coughs> that the consequence of, an in, of uh, increasing uh, the volume of, let's say, bubble two will cause its pressure to go up instead of down. <coughs> And, and uh, 
But the end result of that is that the, uh, uh, the uh, rate law depends on this difference here, <coughs> which can be written in the following way. This is a rate law for the growth of a little fluctuation in the second bubble's radius. And it goes like the difference between the um, uh, surface tension and the elastic modulus of the, um, uh, of, of the film, which is um, around your bubble. Now, if the, foam, if the film is um, uh, devoid, is a single component, this elastic modulus is zero. And therefore, this uh, uh, D delta I2 dt will be positive. They will grow, and you have an instability. <coughs> In general, then, one can calculate that this uh, will either grow exponentially if sigma is greater than e, or it will decrease exponentially if sigma is less than e, and you can calculate the relaxation time for this process, and that is the form when it's collected, connected by a tube. Now, suppose that this difference in magnitude is about 20 dynes per centimeter, and let's suppose you're dealing with a uh, viscosity which might be of the order of magnitude of air, about uh, uh, six, about seven times 10 to the minus four poisons. And uh, under those circumstances, the relaxation time will be of the order of 10 to the minus fifth seconds. All right, now you'll see there, there are some ratios here, like the ratio of the, ratio of the radius of the bubble to the radius of the tube. I say that's the order of magnitude one. And then the, the, the length of the tube in centimeters, let's say of the order of magnitude one. Under those circumstances, <coughs> the relaxation times to the order of 10 to minus fifth seconds. Extremely fast. <coughs> now, suppose, suppose then you know that you have an initial fluctuation. <coughs> of any sort. Drink of water. Thanks. You can have calculate an order of the magnitude of an initial fluctuation. It really doesn't make any difference in, uh, much in the way of magnitude, because however small it is, <coughs> the fluctuation will grow exponentially, and the consequence of that is in a very short period of time, your, your uh, uh, fluctuation will either uh, expand to the point where the bubble, small bubble disappears, or it will relax in the other direction. <coughs> now, from the standpoint of um, imagining that you want to have Boy's apparatus, you want to put two bubbles out, and you want to pulse, puff, 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 breathing in short, but with two bubbles. You have to ask yourself, well, what are you going to try to do? What, you <coughs> what you're actually going to do is try to uh, make your radii really in a periodic way, and then if that's to be true, and if you're able to do, you're going to be able to do that, you must have it so that the elastic modulus is greater than the surface tension over this whole range over which you wish to pulse. <coughs> now, suppose that you uh, uh, want to uh, make some model of a system that you could uh, work with in terms of this, and you think that in terms of a soap film, <coughs> if you blow a soap film, and of course, um, uh, uh, Carol Meisels has worked extensively over on models of this sort. But it's easy to see that if you blow a, a soap film, you're going to have uh, a soap film on the inside and on the outside of the bubble both. You're going to have a liquid film in between them. But you can uh, um, take your conventional hydrodynamic laws and you can conclude that that film is going to thin very, very quickly until it gets down to the order of magnitude of a micron in thickness. And that's why uh, uh, in most cases where you're working with soap bubbles, you're getting light interference colors in indicating that you are in the neighborhood of the wavelength of light. So by and large, then, what we're talking about in, in discussing the stability of soap films would be uh, the, what would happen to a soap bubble whose uh, liquid film is of the order of one micron thick and has, uh, of course, soap in the intervening uh, liquid, soap in the uh, soap or a surfactant in general in the surface film, 
with the possibility of transfer between the surface and, and the bulb. It's in Gibbs, and, and usually in this print, and is usually trenchant style, but it is there exactly this uh, principle. Now, in this particular case, suppose that you expand this uh, a, a bubble. The end result of this is that initially the density of surfactant in the surface is going to decrease. For this width, the uh, surfactant is going to try to transfer from the liquid into the surface to replenish it. But that will cause the concentration of the, of the uh, liquid, of soap in the liquid, to go down, and consequently the equilibrium surface excess will uh, go down and the surface tension will go up. And that is the mechanism by which you uh, increase your surface tension <coughs> through the presence of the surfactant and uh, uh, get a, an elastic modulus. <coughs> now, in order to talk about this in a quantitative way, you say, well, right now, suppose that we do do this expansion. Uh, the film has an area A and a thickness H, and that's a certain volume. And if you expand the bubble, that volume is going to remain constant. So therefore, the product AH has to remain constant. And secondly, like Joe Lewis said about Billy Kahn years ago, the surfactant can run, but it can't hide. And uh, however much surfactant you have, the product of the surfactant in the volume of the liquid plus that on the surface is constant. <coughs> and then finally, we assume that we have some sort of a, of a surface equation of state. I've chosen the Frumpkin equation because it has an interesting adjustable parameter which lets you have phase, phase equilibrium in this. Uh, George could come up with a more complex one, I'm sure. But uh, uh, nonetheless, this will serve our purposes right now. But note that these equations, this equation for the adsorption isotherm, this equation for the, for the, for the surface tension, reduce to the um, lanier langer siskowski equation if alpha equals zero. <coughs> All right, now the uh, elastic modulus, the Gibbs elastic modulus, by the way, the way Gibbs defined this, he does not have a two here. I've used a two here when I, when and if I publish this, I will get rid of the two and go with Gibbs. But uh, the, the quantitative consequences are consistent with what I've done here. When I increase the area of the um, uh, film, uh, I will change theta. But then I will be interested in how theta changes with A. And uh, it's easy to get d sigma d log theta. That comes right out of the uh, front canisers then very quickly to this. But there's an interesting consequence of that. <coughs> You'll notice that uh, if alpha is greater than 2, the maximum theta times 1 minus theta can be is 1 quarter. And you can see if alpha is greater than 2, this term can become negative which has some rather interesting consequences. What it really means is that if alpha is greater than 2, there will be a region in which you have two surface phases in equilibrium. And in fact, if alpha is uh, the order of forward, those uh, two <coughs> surface phases amount to a hundredth of a coverage of 100 and 0.99. And those two things are in equilibrium, and they have the same spreading pressure. Now that will immediately have uh, uh, consequences for this e elasticity, because you see, if you have a total value of theta anywhere in between there, you will have precisely the same spreading pressures, precisely the same surface tension, and therefore no surface elasticity at all. And therefore, in the two, uh, where, you, where your uh, value of theta corresponds to a value in between the two limits, you will have two surface phases and a zero elastic modulus, and therefore you don't, your uh, soap bubble cannot be stable. There's one other bit of surface chemistry that's sort of interesting in this point, and that has to do with, uh, let me back off one. Uh, yes, this Frumpkin equation is stated here. The implication that, it, uh, that is uh, inherent is <coughs> what is said here is that the uh, uh, surfactant, if I may call it that, in solution, is acting according to Henry's law. Uh, and uh, to the extent that you are dealing with, with let's say, a very dilute alcohol or dilute uh, uh, aliphatic acid solution, 
probably would get along quite well with that. But an important thing comes up if you're dealing with a surfactant that can have a critical micelle concentration. Because there again, with the uh, so, uh, solution between, uh, uh, between the two uh, faces of the, of the bubble is above the critical micelle concentration, you substantially above the concentration or rather close to that. So again, you will have a situation where your uh, your uh, uh, surface composition will be in equilibrium with the uh, essentially with the critical micelle concentration, which is constant or nearly so, and therefore your elasticity will again be nearly zero, and you will not have a stable soap film, uh, stable bulk. <coughs> uh, Now, running through all of this, one can uh, get a, a log for d log theta d log a, which depends on a, a ratio of numbers, namely the saturation uh, surface coverage, the Siskowski uh, constant in the Frumpkin equation, the thickness of the film, and then of course this parameter uh, alpha. And essentially what you would like to have is d log theta d log a as close to minus one as you can have it. And that is of course favored by having this quantity very small. Now, the, the other question that is not dealt with in this <coughs> is the question of diffusion. And uh, this uh, comes from a paper that uh, Jacob Lucas and, and I published in the 1960s. And it's a very interesting one that shows what happens, that diffusion does have an uh, influence in the uh, behavior of capillary waves. And that you'll notice that the height, we're dealing here with the um, uh, uh, damping coefficient of capillary waves. And the reason this damping <coughs> goes on with this is that as your uh, wave propagates on the, on the leading edge of the wave, the surfactant is compressed Therefore, the tension goes down, and the trailing edge, the uh, surface is expanded, the tension goes up. So you can think of the, this process trying to retard the propagation of, of the wave. <coughs> well, the diffusion process, uh, uh, let's imagine diffusion were infinitely fast. As soon as the, prop the surface were depleted a little, it'd be immediately replenished. So you wouldn't have any damping from, from that source. All right, here we're dealing with a C10, C8, C7, C6, C5 acid. The uh, uh, Siskowski constant A uh, decreases steadily by about a factor of three each, uh, uh, for each carbon added as you go down. So that here, uh, you, you go through this uh, uh, maximum damping at a very low concentration, and there is no chance in the period of a, uh, the uh, wave for the, uh, uh, the, the depletion of, uh, to be replenished. You have exactly the same height for C8 because the same thing is true, but already by the time you get to C7, you are getting replenishment over the period of the wave, and by the time you get to C6, very strong C5, it's just about all gone. <coughs> uh, the, the business of handling this quantitatively with regard to diffusion in, in uh, this, because of the um, varying thickness of the film, is difficult to work out in, in uh, detail, but one can uh, get an estimate of the relaxation time for that uh, as. Um, by, by considering what would happen if you had a, 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 sh a sharp perturbation in the surface concentration, how fast would it relax? And it's easy to carry out the analysis for that, and the, you, get, you actually get a series, but the leading term goes like h squared over pi squared d. And for these terms, this uh, uh, relaxation time is about 10 to the minus 4 seconds. It could be a good deal longer if you had a much higher viscosity in between. <coughs> All right, this uh, pretty well uh, wraps up what I wanted to uh, 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 say about this. One can estimate orders of magnitude of core areas that would be upper uh, uh, 
minimum limits of it, and uh, orders of magnitude of the surface tensions, and the problems that the uh, Siskowski constant tends to scale with solu solubility. <coughs> So, so that uh, unfortunately, for uh, a lot of these things, they may be very surface active, but you reach a solubility limit, and that's it. Uh, I, I want to say just one, I think that's the last slide. <coughs> one final thing with regard to the uh, uh, parallel between this and respiration. Of course, it is so that your, your uh, alveoli are not just like soap bubbles. They have little membranes in, in, in the middle of them. And yet, it is believed that the, uh, a large part of the resistance to expansion has to do with the tension of the liquid film. And indeed, there are surfactants, uh, the principal one apparently being dipalmatial lecithin, that absent these, a child born with, with absent these will, in all probability, die. <coughs> <coughs> I seem to be missing it myself right now. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot.